but you know. Okay. <laughs> so we will have our opening prayer and then move on to our guest speaker, our esteemed guest speaker, and uh, very, I think, very interesting topic. Uh, so we start with uh, taking refuge in generating bodhicitta once in English and twice in Tibet chant. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by listening to teachings and the other paramitas, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangita dang so ki chok nam la dang chu bardu dagni kyatsu chi Da in so gibe so nam ki Rola venchir sangi drupa so Sangi te dang so ki chok nam la Jang chu bardu dagni kiat su chi Da ijin so ki pe so nam ki Dro la pen chi sangye dro pa so And I hear a cat is saying first with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we uh, imagine uh, the Buddha Chen Rezig and we will, Buddha Chen Rezig is the embodiment of the four immeasurable thoughts. Buddha Chen Rezig embodies immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity, and is the embodiment of these four immeasurable thoughts. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. May we be inspired and blessed by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and our spiritual teachers to have the motivation and the enthusiasm and the power, spiritual power, to accomplish this for all sentient beings. Then we're moving on to uh, the Manjushri uh, mantra. Man Manjushri is the Buddha of wisdom. And uh, this is something we absolutely need in order to attain a, a realization, a direct realization of emptiness and the nature of reality. So the uh, Buddha of wisdom is extremely important. <clears throat> Uh, Manjushri Mantra is Om A Ra Pa Sana D. And when we come to the final repetition of that mantra, we repeat the D many times. And this, this D stands, uh, stands for the Sanskrit root Buddha. It's the root of Buddha and Buddhi. Buddha is the uh, external uh, appearance, you would say, or external expression of an enlightened being. Buddhi is the internal uh, wisdom of an enlightened being. So this uh, mantra is, is about <clears throat> emptiness and the and ultimately basically it's saying there is nothing in existence that has an independent nature. Everything arises dependently based on multiple causes and conditions, infinite causes and conditions actually, and is completely uh, empty of independent existence. So here's here we go with Manjushri Mantra. Omara Patsana di 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 Omara
And now we'll repeat the final syllable D and imagine that we are awakening our own wisdom as we repeat the syllable. Now we'll go to the uh, seven limb prayer, which is uh, uh, an outline form of the seven limb practice which is in the uh, the session that we did on uh, transforming our karma. And there's also a uh, guided guided uh, meditation on that particular transforming our karma that has the seven limb practice. But this is the outline of it. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. And so as we imagine all the, uh, the enlightened beings and the Bodhisattvas and our spiritual teachers and all the Dharma protectors and tantric uh, uh, deities in the space in front of us, we make an offering. And what we're offering here is our intention to be part of awakening, the awakening to a uh, fully integrated, interconnected and wholesome universe where all conscious beings have had a direct realization of the nature of their own being and the nature of reality and have attained happiness and liberation from suffering. So imagine that you're, we're holding all, all conscious beings in, in our hands as we recite this or sing this mandala offering. Saji Perki Jokshime Ram Ri Rab Lingshi Nide Gyan Padi Sang Ye Jing Du Bide Then we send this mandala into the hearts of all the beings in the space in front of us as we say, Idam Guru Radna Mandala Yeriyataya. Okay, today we have a really new and different and special kind of uh, presentation. Our friend um, Claudia, Claudia Neuhauser, uh, who's been uh, coming to these Buddhist classes. Uh, was here last week when we had the discussion on neuroscience and Buddhism. And there was a very uh, stimulating conversation that we all had afterwards. Uh, a lot of talk was about the cognitive psychologist, Donald Hoffman, and his, his uh, hypothesis of the way things exist, which was among the uh, four scientists that we were discussing, his was seemed to be the closest to the Buddhist view. So uh, Claudia is, um, she decided she would investigate the math behind David Hoffman's uh, hypothesis that conscious beings, including humans, have not evolved to perceive the world as it actually is, but have evolved to perceive the world as a simplified species specific user interface. Claudia has a PhD in mathematics from Cornell University. She's vice president of research at the University of Houston and a mathematical biology expert. 
In 2023, she and our Buddhist fellow in residence, Brian Herman, co-authored the book, The Road to Ethical Science, A Guide to Restoring Trust in Science. The book is intended to serve as a guide for both current and future scientists, as well as the lay public in how to make scientific decisions that are ethically appropriate, which is extremely important and very beneficial right now. So um, thank you so much, Claudia, for having the uh, motivation and the enthusiasm and the willingness to do this. And um, I'll turn it over to you now. Hey, thank you. Um, you may expect slides with dense equations, but I have to disappoint you, no slides at all. Especially hey. <laughs> some of you really shouldn't be looking at slides while driving at probably 65 miles per hour on the freeway. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna pick up uh, where Christopher left us last time and also review a little bit. But let me start with something uh, that we don't all see things the same way. And I think we can probably all resonate with this. And I don't mean by this, the arguments we have with each other. That's one way of looking at it. What I wanna do is <clears throat> introduce a few species uh, you see different than we do, but let's start with the human. So the human eye, can resolve two lines about 0.01 degrees apart. So that means about one one thousandth of an inch. That's a gap we can see with our eye. It's about six inches from, from your face and you have good vision. In practice, you can pretty much do, see the width of a fine human hair, but not, a, not stuff that's a lot smaller than that. We can also discern a maximum of about 60 discrete flashes of light per second. So like uh, LEDs, these small little lights, we see as continuous light lights, even though they flicker quite a bit. Um, and so that also depends a little bit on the lighting condition and which part of the retina you use. Side vision is a little bit different than what you see in the front. You can actually see a little bit more on the sides than in the front when it comes to flashes. If we compare ourselves to raptors like eagles and hawks, they have some of the most acute eyesight. Their eyes are densely packed with cones for high resolution images. So if you look at eagles, they see with about 2.5 times the resolution of humans. Yeah. So we will now see things the same way. You can also look at flies. They're particularly interesting. Their vision is optimized for detecting movement and having a wide field of view. Some flies can actually see as many as 250 flashes per second. Compare that to us, we only see 60. So that's around four times more flashes per second than people can perceive. Which also means that flies would actually not enjoy watching a movie. <laughs> <laughs> don't see flies when you're watching a movie, you know why. Because we have 24 frames per second, so they just see individual static slides. So they see a slideshow instead of a movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. They just wonder, why are these people staring at these movies? It's really boring. Um, but the vision is really optimized to react quickly. Like when you try to catch them with a cup when they enter the house. Um, yeah. Really hard to do. Because for them, it's like really slowly the cup is approaching us and looking at it and say, okay, what are you trying to do? You try to catch me, really? <laughs> I never think of Oh. That is very interesting. A, a question. Would that mean that their uh, perception of time is different than our perception of time? I would think so. Uh, for them, the cup approaches really, really slowly. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, they can look at it and say, it's like, really, what are you doing trying to catch me with a cap? <laughs> <laughs> that one out yet? Okay. Mm. Let's go to dragonflies. Their color vision is much, much broader than we have. So humans and most mammals, they have three different kinds of photoreceptors in the eye. And they're sensitive to green, red, and blue. And so what we see is essentially a combination of those three. So dragonflies have no less than 11 types of photoreceptors and up to 30 in some species. That allows them to see even ultraviolet, infrared, and polarized light simultaneously. 
for them, the world looks very different from what we see. Yeah. yeah. Um, snakes, they have thermal vision. They have infrared sensors located in their snouts and that allows them to see warm-blooded prey. So they're just walking around with those thermal glasses on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but not every animal relies on vision to move around. If you look at the stormal, stormal is blind. But a stormal has extremely sensitive touch organs to detect, catch, and eat food faster than the human eye can follow. So there are different ways of perception. Oh. Mm. So these examples already show that we don't all see things the same way. And so an, every biologist will tell you that vision is under selection. So that's nothing new. We know that. So it should come not come as a surprise that fitness plays a role in shaping how species perceive things. That's essentially how evolution works in acts and fitness. But there are also constraints in evolution. So a fly's brain, even though it's really good at figuring out when we want to catch it, does not have the computational power of a human brain. That would require a larger brain. So the size of the brain required to have vision closer to humans would not allow the fly to fly anymore. It would have like this big thing dragging behind it. So <laughs> it would probably not be a good select. <laughs> so in other words, evolution, and that's like most things in life, is optimization under constraints. And so the constraints are to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So since we don't all see things the same way, we already know that we don't see an objective reality, whatever that means anyway. Right. So every species filters out what is not needed and likely a lot more. Mm -hmm. So there's also no universal agreement on what perception is. So what I'm gonna do is review what Christopher said last time and then uh, shed a little bit more light on what how Hoffman thinks about that. So Donna Hoffman's view of the world. So he claims that, and this is a quote, the physical world is not objective, but is a secondary phenomenon caused by consciousness. End of quote. So he bases his claims on two theories, the multimodal user interface and conscious realism. So we're going to unpack both of them separately before we combine them. Uh, they're not that easy to understand when you read newspapers. You know, <laughs> obfuscate things a little bit. But let's look at the multimodal user interface first. So Hoffman wrote a paper with a bunch of other people in 2015, where he introduced different types of perceptual strategies. The paper is called the Interface Theory of Perception. And essentially, they boil down to two different categories. He has like seven different definitions, but they are roughly two different categories. One category assumes that there is an objective world and that perceptual experiences correspond to what this world looks like. This is called veridical perception. So from veritas, true, mm -hmm. it's one way of looking at it. So in essence, veridical perception assumes that there is an objective world and that there are perceptual experiences. And each state in the world causes at, causes at most one perceptual experience. So veridical perception means that a perceptual experience is equal to a state in the world so there may be states in the world our perception has no access to. And so it is equal that the state is equal to a state in the world. That's sort of for what does that really mean? Because we don't really know what the state of the world is. But that's essentially his formalism says the, these two things are the same. And so this veridical perception can be weakened to include what he called realist strategies. They recognize that some of our perceptional experience do not have counterparts in the real world, such as color or taste. But other perceptions, such as shape or motion, are part of the objective world, and we can perceive those more or less accurately. And I think we need to soften this argument of veridical. There is no like equal equality, and here's an object, and this is what we see. We already know that. But the question is, is there something that more or less accurately reflects what we have? And in addition, there are other things we already know, like color or taste doesn't really have an analog there. We see that too. So that's what a radical uh, perception is. 
The other category, and that's the one he is promoting, includes perceptual strategies where perceptual experiences are not veridical. That is, they do not reflect any structures of objective reality. So that can be something totally different. And this is the category he calls the interface perceptual strategy. And he makes this comparison that Christopher mentioned last time. <clears throat> he compares it to a multimodal user interface. And the example that Hoffman uses it are the icons we see on a computer screen. For instance, the file icon is not the actual text file in the computer, but just represents the file, so it's a representation for it. It's a useful way to interact with the computer. We can move the file icon around, we can trash it, can open it, see the text file, but the reality of a file on a computer is much more complex. And so there are essentially two strategies, veridical and non-veridical. He sort of champions the non-veridical one where he has, where he looks at the world that what we see is essentially a user interface, we just see icons. Whereas in the veridical one, we see more or less accurately what's out there. So Hoffman posits that our visual perceptions are non-veridical and resemble a user interface. His argument is that veridical strategies, that is strategies tuned to the true structure of the world, are outcompeted by non-veridical strategies tuned to fitness. And that's pretty much the mathematical argument he does. So he has strategy that's tuned to fitness, and then he uses strategy that's tuned to getting more and more accurate. And he makes the argument, well, and this is not his argument, that's an argument that's been known for a really, really long time, because that's what evolution essentially tells you, that the one that's based on fitness is the one that wins out. Yeah. Um, and so he does a mathematical, or he describes a mathematical model that uses evolutionary game theory. He does the formal definitions of the models, which that gets, makes it hard for other people to read the papers. And then he simply quotes previous results. So he actually doesn't do anything with the formalism. So if you ever want to read these papers, just skip over all the math. <laughs> <laughs> he never uses it anyway. So his argument is there are veridical and non-veridical strategies, and the non-veridical one uses optimizes is is the one that's optimized under a fitness model he has. So any evolutionary biologist would support the claim that selection acts in fitness. That's the whole, that's not new. That's actually how evolution works. So there's nothing really new in there. Right. But he claims that the only time when veridical strategies and those tuned to fitness agree is when fitness increases with the degree of truth. So if the degree of truth, as that increases, fitness increases, the fitness model would agree with one that just acts on the level of truth. A perceptual strategy that balances the fitness advantage of greater accuracy and the cost associated with greater accuracy would, al would also result in a fitness function that favors his intermediate accuracy. So he completely neglects that there are trade-offs like the fly with the big brain that it drags around, that's a trade-off. You won't have that. And so he neglects that. And so for him, the only strategy where fitness and greater truth agree is when they increase the same way. But greater accuracy can comes at a higher cost. So the fitness curve is so probably low at really low accuracy and also low at very high accuracy because there's a cost to getting more accurate. And so in a model that models the uh, accuracy under fitness, you would also end up with something that's intermediate. And you would not end up with greater and greater fitness over time. Hmm. And so that's something he, he neglects in his assessment entirely. Um, so the key is fitness, not whether the strategy re resembles reality or not. Hmm. And his definition of, as I mentioned earlier, his definition of vertical perceptual strategy is really, really strict. He sort of equates the thing, what I see is exactly equal to what's out there. And we know that actually, that can't be the case. Like if you look at a table, we don't see individual atoms. 
we see something because we can't, we don't have that resolution, uh, we just see a solid table in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, so let me talk a little bit about mathematical models, about equations. <laughs> <laughs> So a mythical model that exhibits, exhibits behavior that is consistent with what we observe in nature does not prove that the assumptions of the model are correct. Mm -hmm. So that's important to realize. Just because the model sort of looks like what we see or mimics what we see doesn't mean that the assumptions go in the model explain what we see. And I can give you an example in the planetary motion. The geocentric model assumes that the Earth is in the center, whereas the heliocentric model assumes that the sun is in the center. Both models use different mathematical approaches to explain the same observ observational data, namely movement of plants in the sky. But as we all know, over time, the heliocentric model proved to be more accurate and simpler, especially after the work of Kepler and Newton, when they provided a deep understanding of celestial mechanics. But you can have those two models. They explain the data well. But we know that the geocentric model, we are not the center of the universe. It's neither is the sun, actually, but the sun is more the center of the universe of what we see. And so that's an important distinction to make. Just because a model explains something doesn't mean the, mod the assumptions of the models explain the nature. So it needs to be noted that the, his arguments, they do not show that visual perception does not reflect an objective reality. It only shows that visual perception does not necessarily show reality. So you, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. So the evolutionary approach shows that our visual perception falls short of seeing the objective reality meaning, for instance, we may not see all the details. And that is, if you take constraints into account, you end up with something intermediate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's something we already know. That's nothing new. Moreover, since evolution for <clears throat> takes time, we actually cannot exclude that there will be or already is an organism where the most accurate perception of the objective world is the perception with the highest fitness. So if we waited another billion years, maybe we, we could see a lot more detail. <laughs> Evolution just hasn't had time to realize that. The other constraints I mentioned earlier that might prevent perception from ever getting there. So they mean that never be a fly that can see color the way we do. Right. Right. Or us looking at cups coming at us or anything coming at us in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should be times really, really useful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Neo in the Matrix, you know. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> saw the bullets coming. It was like a fly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so Hoffman compares the way we perceive the world visually to a user interface. And he carries the anal analogy further and compares space time to a desktop and then jumps to a conclusion that I cannot follow. So this is a quote. Our perception of space time is analogous to the desktop and our perception of objects and their properties is analogous to the icons on the desktop. So finds it good. So space time, desktop, objects, icons. Yep. But just as the language of desktops and icons is the wrong language for describing the true structure of the computer, so also the language of space-time and physical objects is the wrong language for describing the true structure of the objective world. Just because something is analog doesn't mean you can come to the same conclusion. Mm. There is no no further justification just as he sort of sees, ah, the desktop, that's like the real world. And so since the icons don't, are not really what the desktop is, the real world is not really what it is and we can't use our language. That's, <laughs> you should see a big jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jumping to conclusion. So his view of perception implies that everyday objects such as tables, chairs, and the moon, and the moon exist only as experiences of conscious observers. Mm -hmm. 
what we see is an interpretation of the object. Moreover, an object that a person perceives visually only exists when the person looks at the object. When a person looks away, the person no longer experiences the object. When another person looks at the object, that person has a different experience. So in particular, two different people cannot have the same experience when they look at the object. And so I'm going to pick that up after talking a little bit more about conscious realism. Okay. Yes. So his interpretation is really when you look at it, it's there. When you no longer look at it, it's not there. We'll get back to that. So it's time to okay. conscious realism. So Hoffman turns the mind-body problem on its head. Instead of asking how conscious experiences arise from physical systems, Hoffman asks how conscious agents construct physical objects and their properties. So he goes the other way around. Most of the other neuroscientists, most scientists have, here's a world, and then how do we look at that? Then he goes the other way around. Here's what we see, and we construct the objects from there. So according to Hoffman, that's a quote, conscious realism states that the objective world consists of conscious agents and their experiences. So for him, all that all there is in the objective world are conscious agents, so like us, mm -hmm. and the experiences we have. So conscious realism denies the existence of unconscious particles in the objective world. In this sense, consciousness becomes fundamental and there does not exist an unconscious universe. So when Christopher mentioned that uh, Hoffman so looks at consciousness as the, fund, as the fundamental thing, the foundation, that's what it's really meant by that. There is no unconscious universe. It's just us agents having conscious experiences and we sort of think that's what it's out there. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book in 2019, um, The Case Against Reality. <laughs> I actually realized the had is on my Kindle, so I must have ordered that a good while ago. Then I remembered I read through the first four chapters, and then I dropped it. I, love the title. So I picked it up again. Um, so in this book, he states, and that's a quote, and I'm somewhat longer quote. So if we grant that there are conscious experiences, and there, there are conscious agents that enjoy and act on experiences, then we can try to construct a scientific theory of consciousness that posits that conscious agents, not objects in space-time, are fundamental, and that the world con consists entirely of conscious agents. So right. that's really the way he looks at the world is it's a bunch of conscious agents right. making up stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm making up stuff, that's my interpretation. So. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't say that. Uh, so in other words, if one adopts a conscious realist view of the world, then there are no physical objects and the properties that exist independently of the conscious agent who perceives them. Okay. So no physical objects and the properties that they don't exist independently of us yeah. perceiving them. Turns out Hoffman is not the first one who claims that the perception of objects is not independent of a conscious agent. Um, apparently, the first philosopher who made this claim in the Western world was Bishop George Berkeley. So he lived between 1685 and 1753, so some time ago. He wrote uh, the three dialogues between Hylas and Philonus in opposition to skeptics and atheists. It's actually quite readable. Mm. And it's actually kind of fun to read. So there are two protagonists in this dialogue. One is Hylas, who represents materialism and skepticism. And the other is Philonus, who represents Berkeley's own views on immaterialism. So Philonus, who is essentially Berkeley, mm -hmm. he argues that the objects we perceive are not independent material substances but rather collections of ideas that exist only in minds. So it's very similar to the way Hoffman thinks. Hylas, so he's uh, 
materialist and skeptic, initially defends the common sense belief that physical objects exist independently of perception. But while Berkeley wrote the book, so Philonis gradually convinces him that all we ever experience are, are ideas, so sensations, perceptions in our minds. So Berkeley, through the character of Philonis, argues that reality consists of ideas perceived by minds and the existence of the physical world is dependent on perception. So for Berkeley and uh, that for Hoffman, to exist is to be perceived. Um, interesting. So it's not a new idea and quite frankly, adding a math model doesn't really add anything to the idea because you can't really prove it with a math model. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, <clears throat> Hoffman continues to develop simple mathematical models of conscious agents to understand cognition and agency. And these models, they fall in the broad class of models. They can be described as agent-based network models. Um, each agent follows the same mathematical rules and there are rules that describe how they interact with each other. And there are other models for the, like, the spread of infectious diseases, are models for competing species. In these models, they can exhibit really complex behavior, but they may or may not describe reality. There are mathematical models, simplified descriptions, where we make the assumptions to capture what's what nature shows up, to capture the behavior. And so that's actually sort of the research area I've been in for many years. So I've built these models for infectious diseases, predator prey models, competition models, evolutionary models, and so on. And so I have one of the models, um, I worked with somebody at Mayo Clinic, he worked on viral therapy of cancer. So that's using viruses to kill cancer cells. And so these models can be quite useful for that. Um, so we use them to figure out what properties viruses have to have when you engineer them so that they are most effective in killing cancer cells. But it's a very simplified approach. So they, these models can be very useful, but they may or may not describe reality. And so we kind of use that to conclude that there is no physical world. Okay, so with this, let me combine the two of them. So let me get at the core of his argument. <clears throat> so if one combines the multimodal user interface and conscious realism, one ends up with a world where the objects we see are icons, the con conscious agent experiences. These objects no longer exist when the conscious agent no longer experiences them. Mm. So that's the world he has. So the view of perception is then used to modify the question. If a tree falls in a form that no one hears around, is around to hear it, does it make a sound? To if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does the tree exist? Mm -hmm. So we can say that the tree does not exist if we take what we see as an icon instead of the true nature of an objective world. Mm -hmm. Because if we no longer look at it, the icon is gone from our brain, so wherever that icon is. Right. So what Hoffman proposes is not new, and he actually says so in the 2019 book he wrote, uh, Conscious Realism and this is a quote, conscious realism advances an ontology radically different from the physicalism that dominates modern neuroscience and science more generally. Radically different, but not radically new. Many key ideas of conscious realism and the interface theory of perception have appeared in prior sources. From ancient Greek philosophers such as Parmenides, Pythagoras, and Plato through more recent German philosophers such as Leibniz, Kant, and Hegel. And from Eastern religions such as Buddhism and Hinduism to mystical strands of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So that question of what reality is has been around. For a long time. A long time. <clears throat> Since we thought of, had brains to sort of philosophy. <laughs> um, so this way of looking at reality isn't the only way. And so I'm going to introduce Bertrand Russell. He was a British philosopher and mathematician. He was born in 1872 and died in 1970, so he lived a really long life. He was a very prominent logician and wrote a major work on logic, Principia Mathematica, with his teacher, Ian Whitehead, who's also a famous mathematician. 
taught at the London School of Economics, the University of Cambridge, and the University of California, Los Angeles, and he received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1950. So he was actually a really good communicator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always the case with mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> so Russell wrote about the ultimate nature of reality. He was a realist, at least in his early days. Later in his life, things went a little bit different. Um, that is, he believed that there is a mind-independent reality. And so what he introduces, and that is so important, I think, to make that distinction between the way Russell looks at it and Hoffman or others who on that side look at it. <clears throat> so he introduces a distinction between public objects and private sense data. Mm -hmm. So according to Bertrand Russell, public objects are the external objects in the world that we perceive via sense data. Okay. So there is something beyond the icon. They're objective and they exist independently of any one individual's perception. So public objects are accessible to multiple observers and are understood to be the common source of different individual sense data. So if there is a public object like a table, we all look at it, we all perceive it a little bit different, but we all look at the same thing. Mm -hmm. and it so public objects are shared. If we look at a public object, we may not all have the same experience, but the object exists whether or not we look at it. And there is one quote where, <clears throat> one example it gives like, you have a cat, you look at it, you see the cat three hours later, you didn't look at it, so cat didn't exist, but then you look at it again, it exists again, cat is hungry. You sort of ask, well, what happened in these three hours? All of a sudden, the cat who wasn't there gets hungry. So there must have been something in between, even though we didn't look at it. Mm -hmm. So there is no claim that what we see when we look at a public object accurately reflects reality. Visual perception is still an approximation of reality, and it's also shaped by evolution. So then when you go back to the veridical and non-veridical perception, those two theories, they actually have in common that neither really thinks that we see the objective world accurately. Regardless of which theory we subscribe to, we all agree that color isn't the, in the objective world, just to use that as one example. Both theories also have in common that we need to take our senses seriously. So Hoffman gives a very compelling example in his 2019 book, where he says, I must take my senses seriously. Must I therefore take them literally? No. So he makes a distinction between literal and seriously. Mm -hmm. Logic neither requires nor justifies this move. Evolution has shaped our perceptions with symbols like streaking green dot or biohazard triangle that warn us and guide us without depicting the truth. So yes, if I see a rattlesnake within my way, I must take it seriously. Huh. But if you follow that there is something brown, sleek, and sharp, and sharp of tooth when no one observes it. Snakes are just icons of our interface that guide adaptive behaviors such as flee. Mm -hmm. So it says, like, if I don't flee, well, I get killed and I can't reproduce. So it is under selection. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So don't jump off a cliff. Don't jump out of the window. That has conse real consequences. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so thinking about that, the difference between these two theories lies in whether we accept, accept the existence of public objects. That really what boils down to it. It has nothing to do with perception is under selection, which it is, what it what fitness optimizes, and so on. It's a difference. Are there public objects, yes or no? Mm -hmm. So the non-veridical perception theory, so that's Hoffman's theories and other people who subscribe to this, they deny the existence of public objects. The vertical perception theory accepts the existence of public objects. Hoffman's theories on the side of denial of the existence of public objects, but that's a philosophical argument, not a scientific one. 
in some ways, there's sort of a way to reconcile the two views. And it's not a complete reconciliation, but you can sort of combine the two. So when Hoffman looks at an object, he stops at the icon. There is no public object that is shared when others create the icon. And there's no object when nobody perceives it. And someone who believes in the existence of public objects looks at an object, they also see the icon. But they believe that there is an object behind it that everyone else who looks at the object also uses to create the icon. And that remains when nobody looks at it. Hmm. Important is that neither view can be scientifically proven to be correct or false. Mm -hmm. You can't even prove that we're not living in a simulation, right? right. So this debate, debate becomes a philosophical one and is actually as old as philosophy itself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's what I got out of reading. That's <laughs> the impossibility of proving anything. Yeah, really. I mean, it, that's that's really great, Claudia. Thanks so much for doing that because. Um, it it is true that there's <clears throat> so far uh, there's been no proof that consciousness arises from matter, and there's been no proof that matter arises from consciousness. <laughs> um, and what it makes me think of what you were talking about in Buddhism is what the Buddha talks about as conventional reality and ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha says that consciousness exists. It is you know, undeniable that we have the experience, we have awareness. But Buddha also says that um, a very, very, very subtle form of matter exists, which is at the level of light, light energy. And so that the consciousness and the this light energy are always <clears throat> interacting with one another. So that in other words, and I know quantum physics has has gotten to this point with, with many objects, they can get down to the you know, the smallest uh, particles that are imaginable and a light begins to emit from them and it begins to emit in like a prism, like rainbow color. So at the essence of, of every object that we're looking at, quantum physics would say there is some kind of light. And what the Buddha says is that we are interacting. We have a, none, neither consciousness exists independently and neither does the light exist independently the light is always coming from previous moments of the light and the consciousness is coming from previous moments of the consciousness and there is a um, sort of a dynamic interaction between them but that interaction uh, is not uh, an inherently independently existing interaction and neither is the consciousness and neither is the the object so it's Partially, what I what I hear coming out of this is um, when we see the objects out there, like the table, like you mentioned, we all conventionally agree that that's a table. Otherwise, right? How could we function with anything? I mean, that's the way we function. We all have a we have an agreement as human beings. I, I assume animals have their own kind of agreement that I don't understand, but we all agree that they're animals, right? And they um, and everything's through that agreement. We can see that everything has a function and a place, and we know how to work with it um, to achieve things, to achieve goals. But at the ultimate level, what the Buddha says is that all of the things that we that exist appear to exist um, independently actually exist in a very interdependent way, so that the the consciousness can affect. Um, the appearance of the matter or affect how um, our response and the and the matter itself can be affected by the consciousness. I mean, it, that's quite obvious. This particular piece of matter was was put together by a consciousness. It's not, you know, it's not like a, you know, in the form of a tree. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, I don't know that there's an answer that we can pin down but um but buddhism does not does not do what uh, donald hoffman says buddhism does not say that there's nothing out there at all mm. but buddhism says there is there is nothing that exists independently right the way that it appears to us right and that everything is interdependent and functioning in ways that we can't we don't yet comprehend and we don't yet 
uh, have the kind of we don't have the capacity to uh, um, even analyze that, imagine that, experience that uh, until you can, it, what Buddhism says, you get to an, a level of, of inc incredible uh, wisdom where you have this realization of how things truly exist. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, there's, again, I don't think there's a, the answer will lie in each one of our own experience. experience and the and our experience very much is um, like evolution. It's an evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, the, the, the way Buddha terms evolu evolution is karma, you know, cause and effect. It's an evolutionary process. And uh, we learn through, uh, we learn to change the actions that we engage in of body, speech, and mind, depending on whether those actions uh, give us a result that is mm, beneficial to us or those actions are, are presenting a, a result that's harmful or destructive, mm -hmm. whether to us or to whatever appears to be outside of us. So it is a form of selective evolution. And it's, a, it's, it's interesting. Buddha does posit, which is not most, uh, I don't know that any uh, Western science posits reincarnation. So Buddha does posit that the consciousness will um, leave one particular body and depending on its evolution of karma will come into a different kind of body or the same kind of body or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But there's, there's no proof. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, this is, this is all super reminiscent too. There's a, there's a writing by Jay Tsongkhapa, um, which, where he's really going through, he, he gives a presentation of how the mind only school conceptualize how karma works. Um, and it hits on a lot of these points um, very specifically in, in um, that essentially the idea being that there is a subtle level of consciousness um foundation consciousness or they call it the kunshi the the namche uh, anyway in which the potentialities or seeds of our karma the bakchaks they like sound like uh, like little seeds uh, which are really just potentialities based on our actions of body speech and mind which, which we perceive through our consciousness. Right. Mostly what, depend, what drives how a consciousness ripens for somebody is how we perceive that. Like we do an action, we do something kind for somebody that plants a seed in our mind that will then ripen. And there's a whole debate between the mind only school and about where that seeds are stored and where karma right. is stored. But essentially the argument I believe, if I recall correctly, in uh, at least in the mind only school, is and possibly my, the Madhyamika Prasangika also is because there's this very, there's a famous story, some of you, or analogy where three beings, a human, a, a hell being, a, and a hungry ghost, are all looking at a glass of water and they're perceiving three different th things. One, well, we're perceiving a delicious glass of water. Others, the hell being is perceiving pus and, and gross and, and the, the hungry ghost is seeing water, but can't like, they're having completely different experiences of it. And anyway, there's a, there's a whole commentary on that and, and debate <laughs> where, yeah. well, are they valid? Are they each having valid perceptions? Is there anything really out there? Exactly. Is it, are there three, you know, are they, yeah, yeah. And I, if you haven't seen that, I'm happy I can, I can share that, that there's a reading from this, uh, and commentary of Jay Tsongkhapa's text. Um, but anyway, it's just hitting on a lot of these ideas and, and essentially what I believe it comes down to, I think one of the take home points is, what we are perceiving is our mind perceiving our mind because our mind is projecting those outward things and that means just like you're saying a fly's mind is going to project something different 
than what we project, even though there may be, like you said, it's not that there's nothing necessarily out there, <laughs> but, and the nature of what exactly is out there is, is very, very difficult for us to understand. And I think is a extremely subtle form of consciousness uh, energy. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I just want to throw that there, it is, it's so cool because there are these thousand year old, <laughs> if, you know, 500 year old commentaries based on these thousand year old texts where they're, they're hashing this out and, it, and they're coming to some very close. Uh, and I think, like you said, I think to truly perceive it directly to which, cause they all say it's the perception, the direct perception of emptiness which is, a, in a sense, the direct <laughs> perception of, of the nature, the true nature of our mind is the goal and, it, and is a point at which these things do become clear. There is, there's a wisdom that's born of that, that we will see. Um, the, the other thing that I mentioned about the tree falling in the forest, I remember a teacher telling me, no, the, the tree doesn't exist as long as there's no perceiver. However, there are always perceivers. There's always Buddhas. There's always enlightened beings. <laughs> They're perceiving the universe. Therefore, it, again, I don't know. It kind of gets back to your. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's the does a tree does it make a sound? And the answer to that would be kind of well, what tree? What sound? There depends on who the perceiver is. And if there is no okay. perceiver, then no, it doesn't exist. But the argument that many Buddhists would say is there is always a perceiver because there are omniscient enlightened beings mm -hmm. because that is a possibility, mm -hmm. which again, this gets back into the importance of logic where can you prove enlightenment truly exists? And I don't know. I, I, we, I don't know that I, I certainly don't have the tools yet. <laughs> um, to, to debate, to feel like I can debate that properly. Um, but I'm just sort of passing on, you know, what I've been told is that logically it can be proven just in the same way that the, the proof of, of past lives mm -hmm. is, is, is a logical argument based on um, what is its substantial cause? Well, right. it can't, you know, it's must be a previous moment of consciousness is the only logical um, uh, right. non-contradictory explanation for that. Um, Kavita wants to comment um, on that. There's a comment in the chat. Yeah, there's a comment in the chat from Sacred One Unity, which I think is relevant and um, we will perceive what we are able to handle depending on our efforts, intentions, and practice. As we let go of our conditioned beliefs, we can truly Which is, yeah. see truly as they are causes and conditions. And I, I want to um, jump on that because another way of phrasing this, it was something that um, the monks have said when we were studying uh, the tenets and philosophy specifically and, mm -hmm. and the nature of how things exist, one of the um, blanket explanations Geshe Drakpa would use for, for example, the hell being the hungry ghost and the human, why they're different, um, why uh, dragonflies has a different set, sense of uh, apparatus than a fly and human and so forth was based on our um, let's say the momentum of our karmas they would use the word predisposition and so due to the consciousness having a dynamic never ceasing trajectory of propensities Exactly. Exactly. That. Yeah, and so the other, I want to circle back to your comment about it. what reincarnates, and mm -hmm. um, Chittamatra uses a, a explanation. What they term the English translation is "mind basis of all," as if it's some kind of 
uh, repository, if you will, that's like can be found. However, Madhyamika Prasangika um, does not posit the right. mind body refuted by saying that no, even uh, this seeming it goes back to the, the momentum of perpetual mom, perpetual perpetual momentum of the propensities. Um, that are dynamic and due to the energy, you could almost say the energetic magnetism of those propensities um, can give the impression that there's a, quote, mind basis of all. But in fact, uh, that is not the case. There is nothing other than the, pro the infinitude of the propensities in perpetual uh, well, evol evolution. Evolution, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the and yeah that 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 that's a, the Tibetan term bakchak, which means that that seed and it's it is that energetic potential that is created when we it's the it's the karmic potential based on what the movement of our mind and I what it mo right, motivates. Right. So yeah, yeah, I mean the comment is in the chat is spot on. We. We're we lost your sound, sound, Brian. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah no. No, I was just going to say, yeah. The the comments. I mean, that, yeah, that's all exactly spot on. And the comment and that Tibetan term bakchak is is a term for that energetic that karmic seed or or energetic potential that right. that like keeps going, you know. Um, and um, we are we see we perceive and that. Chandra Kirti and John Jetson Kappa's commentary about this um, analogy of three beings looking at a glass of water and seeing completely right. different things. Right. They're being forced to see it that way based on the energetic potentials of their past karma. Or the, it, 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 yeah. Right. They've got their karmic, karmic propensities. And as those change, our perceptions of that quote unquote glass of water and whatever will change. Right. Um, and that's what that's the whole point of our practice. Um, so if you go back to uh, yeah. the example Claudia was giving of a fly, and if a fly say there's a glass of water, what we would call a glass of water, and the fly sees that glass of water. And then there's some being that we're not even aware of because it's not within our realm of uh, electromagnetic frequency yeah, to even yeah. see is also perceiving that what we're calling a glass of water. Now, conven conventionally, and this is what conventional existence is, it's just an agreement among those who are in right. a similar, okay, have similar propensities. Yeah. Like we're humans, we have similar propensities. So right. we have an agreement of what, say, that glass of water is. Right, right. But I remember something that um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche said. He said, <laughs> yes, there is something there. Yes, the fly is, something is appearing to the fly there, mm -hmm. and something is appearing to the quote-unquote hell being that yeah. is there, and something is appearing to the human that is there. The humans, with their propensities, call it a glass of water. But Lama, Ropa, Lama Zopa Rinpoche said, Rinpoche said, what is there is, what is actually there is so subtle that it's as if it was an illusion. That's if it was illusory because right. it is so subtle. And, and this goes back to what I was talking about with just basically light energy and the propensity for um, particular uh, beings and whatever level they're at to see it or experience it in completely different ways. Like you said, Claudia, the, the fly is it has a completely different experience than we do, but there is something that is there that the fly is bouncing off of or or uh, that it's appearing in a particular way to the fly. It's appearing in a particular way to the humans. It's appearing in a particular way to some other uh, kind of consciousness. And that's makes that's 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 way more subtle than uh, what we usually tend it's to think subtle, of. And yet it circles back to the importance of morality and ethics and how our conduct over infinitude time, the more moral and non-harming and so forth. It's interesting because it's it circles back to a very practical thing of mm -hmm. the importance of morality and, if you will, 
extend that to compassion. Go and, further. And why is moral? Why is morality and compassion important? Take it further. Why? Well, I'm what I'm pointing at is if you take this conversation of how the how appearances mm -hmm. appear back to you, then the more you know, your experience becomes one of bliss ultimately. Is the, you know, you become right. happier and less suffering. And everything you see becomes happier and less suffering. But why? Why does because, that I don't know because that. your consciousness is le is perceiving every action and thought of behavior, speech, and mind that you that you do, you are perceiving. And it's like it's I've had it a video recorder and it's it is it's creating the potential is it's being recorded in in whatever your foundation consciousness or in your mirror eye or whatever you know wherever we want to get into that that's a whole nother debate <laughs> but um but our own perceptions of our morality are what will ripen later are planting seeds essentially that when the conditions are ripe will ripen and that's the whole definition of good and bad karma is simply will it if something ripens that will hurt you or something that ripens that will feel pleasant and wonderful there's no good or bad inherent good or bad it's just is it going to hurt you or help you and that depends on a lot of those things we talked about earlier, like your motivation, your intention, the things that plant those seeds. But you're, you're, you're right, Kavita. I mean, at least as I've always taught, heard, been taught it, the, this all points to the, the, the importance of morality, um, that you cannot talk about emptiness without also talking about karma, right? right? Like, because karma is what makes empty emptiness is what makes karma work and um and our perceptions of what we do with our body speech and mind will will ripen create potentialities that will ripen as either pleasant or unpleasant experiences and the buddhist taught us that you know those 10 actions that hey these are going to ripen well <laughs> if you do these 10 things they're going to ripen really you know in, in a bad way um and you know again try it out see what Right. I think that's why that is the very first practice that the Buddha has us do, which is the practice of morality. And the reason I was trying to get was, what's the reason? And the reason is that uh, we, we exist in an interdependent system. We don't exist in a, if we existed in an independent system, nothing could interact, nothing would move, nothing, everything would be frozen solid. But this is a very a uh, fluid interdependent system and the, and in the inter, in the system of interdependence what works is not destruction what works is not things that are going to cause division and separation and break up that interdependent uh system what works is things that uh nourish and cultivate an interdependent system right. and you we can translate that as morality mm -hmm. ethics Ethics cultivates interdependence, a healthy, wholesome kind of interdependence. Uh, you know, compassion cultivates healthy interdependence. Uh, things like anger and uh, a war and killing and destruction break up and, and uh, sort of try to cut into pieces all of this interdependent uh, system. And that's why they create suffering. And basically it comes down to what works and what doesn't work in an interdependent system. Right. That's, what, that's why I think uh, you know, morality and compassion is what is driving um, our, uh, the evolution that we're experiencing, mm -hmm. whatever phase of evolution we're at. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Sacred One Unity wants these ideas shared that other ones some other comments. Well, they're um, they're putting them down. So it, uh, in order, um, what you see may not be what it seems unless you can perceive beyond the physical eyes. You know, I think we've yeah, said that. And, right, you know, right. something that uh, Claudius covered 
um, and we've talked about it. And, the, it. and then this behavior and stuff, morality matters because until we are awake, we cannot truly see the karmic patterns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to just insert an overarching concept into this that something we've covered before and is always pervasive, kind of pervades and is always hovering around uh, existence and our and the experience of existence um, and this is that when the, the often reality is sort of sorted out between you know um, in this two spheres of this the subjective consciousness and then the other sphere would be um the objects being perceived. Well, there are three, and then the interaction. I'm, I'm not going to cover that one. Yet. Yeah, but subjective consciousness and the that which is being observed by this objective consciousness, and um, you know, intuitively and somewhat experientially, this has to do with the nature of all of reality. You know, the infinitude of reality. Subjective consciousness in my understanding or my gut feeling about it is the best uh i the subjective consciousness itself is as i mentioned earlier a perpetual unfolding that has a trajectory a momentum being you know that we call karma or karmic propensities whatever so this this is going on and, and we can imagine that this subjective consciousness is can exist with all manner of apparatus in terms of the headsets and different types of creatures and beings and realms the forms, and yeah. it doesn't matter in in terms of um this buddhist overview the similarly the objective quote unquote reality whatever seemingly is out there that the consciousness is apprehending this dynamic this is uh this also is in perpetual revelation is perpetually unfolding evolving moving we all know this but i think it's uh important circling back to Teresa, uh, claudia's presentation because of the way our sense faculty works mm -hmm. we can't see the motion right and so right. we have a big time propensity to concretize but the main thing and then you know the main thing i wanted to what i was Point of my insertion here is that these two things are codependent, and this is, I think, what Buddha brought into, you know, this layer of if you strip down all the hoo ha and just get it down to, you've got subjective consciousness and an appearing reality that's that um, that the subjective consciousness is experiencing. Mm -hmm. You can see just logically there. This is so. <laughs> right. 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 The thing that we always have to keep in mind as Buddhist practitioners is that both of these are dynamic, never stopping. They never stop evolving and um, and are completely dependent. So this is why what we do matters, you know, and why we study Buddhism and why we do these practices and why all this stuff mm -hmm. is that we're trying to uh get this relationship out of one, as Buddha pointed out, of suffering mm -hmm. and do the types of behavior that get it, you know, and, and we can see that there are, yeah. even even in our human realm, we could see that there are more enlightened beings who are, for example, clairvoyant and mm -hmm. uh, can bilocate and omniscient. Well, you hear stories about Anyway, yeah. you know, I think some of us have yeah. had contact with people with these yeah. Yeah. capabilities. But anyway, yeah. I just wanted to, to no no that's a that. that's a really good point because everything that we look at which appears to be uh matter you know appears to be solid matter out there mm -hmm. quantum physics has told us right. you get down to the you know uh smallest particles and what you have is constant movement right it's energy and so that energy is constantly moving and changing this is why things will degrade, go out of existence, or things will come back into existence, say from seed, you know, right. another tree grows. Um, so it's a it's constant flux, both of the consciousness and the what's appearing to the consciousness as as uh, for us, it appears as solid matter. 
because we don't have the bandwidth to see, you know, what quantum physics can can tell us is existing there. So it's really, yeah. And the way to make this, rather than to, you know, get angry at the table and smash it into pieces with a hammer, how can we, you know, have a better kind of relationship? And I, you know, I'm using the table as a very neutral example, but we see what happens in war. You know, we get angry at other living beings and smash them because we don't like what they are doing. And that doesn't help no. anything. I mean, it's all, we can't even do that until we concretize something and then call it bad. We're always concretizing, right? So, yeah. all of these, all of the immorality and harming that happens depends on, you know, seeing happening. things as very independently existing, concretizing it and saying, and, and, just and, making a decision you know, about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to go back to something Brian said. This idea that, because I think we're, if I understand where Hawking comes from, it's like, you know, consciousness creates everything. The other view is stuff exists, consciousness sees it either independently or dependently or ultimately or eventually or whatever, but it's still something that exists. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you look at a painting, you look at it during the night, so everybody has a different way of thinking and interpreting. But then Brian made a comment about, you know, this question about the tree and the forest. And, you know, does a tree really exist? And then the Buddhist, if I understood what you said, the Buddhist explanation is, well, the tree does exist, but it always exists because there is a perceiver. There's always a perceiver. Which means that, yeah. and I, I guess I might, they're probably being a perceiver with a consciousness. Well, but, I am too. So, yeah. but that would then go back to tend to side more with the Hoffman approach that the consciousness actually dictates the existence of that, which is not what I, I mean, Buddhism, I thought said something, things exist, they may exist interdependently and not independently, but they do exist and you do observe it. So that's one, that's one uh, kind of thing I'm trying to um, clarify in my mind. Um, and then the second thing, which is something that we've talked about before, which continued for me continues to be a struggle, is that you know, as you as your consciousness evolves and as you continue to see things either differently or more clearly, or I'm not sure what clearly is the right description. Just as you perceive it differently. Um, you know. We get to a point where we reach enlightenment or understand emptiness, but how do we know that that place that we've gotten to is truly emptiness or truly enlightenment? Because then it becomes a subjective experience, and subjective experiences are different for every entity that experiences the subjective experience does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know well you know i'm gonna i'm just gonna throw this in because it doesn't exactly address your question but it's sort of related it's a simplistic analogy mm -hmm. but we not i'm likening the evolution of our consciousness and I would say that it's not that it changes, or I'd say it expands its capacity for bandwidth. Okay, let's just use that as the working hypothesis that I'm about to spew out here, <laughs> which is the analogy would be in the same way that I'm in this room. So right now, for me, this is what exists. I go up on the roof of the room and then suddenly the yard exists you know as i ascend in altitude mm -hmm. i see more of what exists mm -hmm. you know th this mm -hmm. is not a new metaphor but my bandwidth as i and using all my senses my bandwidth increases you know again all these analogies have their limitations but i think i'm guessing brian in relation to your question that as we expand our bandwidth, there's a, probably a point that we will be, have, be hard pressed to relate to how we used to think now mm -hmm. as compared to almost like a little toddler and as compared to how you know we think now. 
but I don't know. I mean, I I only have these intuitive. Um, all I can claim is these intuitive senses, but you know, um, it is highly subjective. And, well, and, I, and that's a good question. Yes, yeah, so, but that doesn't say that the VR didn't exist even though you couldn't see it or you didn't observe it because this is your... Yeah, this is my current reality. reality yeah. Right, however, I think what, what Brian was referring to with regards to the other analogy is although at the time COVID is on the ground floor and not perceiving the yard, there are people on the second floor perceiving the yard and therefore the yard does exist. Well, I if I'm taking the two in now, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, well, you know, that kind of thing. It know? doesn't exist for us if it we're not exist, seeing right. it, it, but exist it exists us. in our mind. Right. Well, there. I got to go back to my other comment earlier <laughs> because Okay, take the tree falling in the woods to yeah. perceive it, and, and Brian says, well, yes, because enlightened beings see the tree. Well, don't forget, you're superimposing a concrete tree on what enlightened beings, so we're still, from our perspective, going tree, and who the hell knows what an enlightened being is seen when right. they look out into well, the massive energetic tree. movement in a, quote, <laughs> forest. I mean, um, okay, but they see something. They see, they see something. something. In, right, something. In, but we so much want them to see a tree, even no, though no, we're not looking. They, they, they can call it what they want. I guess. <laughs> my, my, my point is that, you know, and this is something that I was thinking about when Claudia was talking, you know, this idea that it doesn't exist unless you see it. Well, you know, we know that the earth is older than this than any human species or any uh, higher level consciousness that exists. The data says it. You cut a tree, it's got lots of rings. Some trees are hundreds of years old. And well, a two-year-old didn't hasn't observed the tree for more than two years, but it's still oh, 200 years old. I mean, you know, so but that is also only because when you say the data shows it. Who's perceiving that data? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, yeah, it's, it's so, not the data of a clock. All that data is processed through a consciousness. Yeah. Well, yeah so, I, I, I mean, yeah. it's just, we need to keep that in mind. Yeah. My point in just saying it, it always exists, because that's a that's more of a, 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 a debate logical answer of, of there is always a perceiver because yeah. it, yeah. because of the logical proof that, that consciousness is never ending. Therefore, the idea is there is an experience of a quote unquote tree. I mean, a lot of this, I think we get hung up on because we say we want it to quote unquote exist. Well, what does exist mean? That's the thing. Like when you say, well, does it exist out there? Do you mean, does it exist inherently, independently? Uh, and the answer, right. Yeah, yes. Drapa again. Uh, this is the word, in his meditation a, room. Yeah, it is, and, and that's okay. <laughs> and <he's> laughing. <laughs> this is Geshe Drapa in his meditation seat in his meditation hut where he meditated by himself for nine years, listening to us. He would love this. Having a good time. <laughs> Glad we're. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, I love it. Did, was somebody else? Somebody else was throwing in a comment. I don't think so. No? I don't know. I thought I heard a muffled somebody saying something. <laughs> um, where, 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 where are we? Uh, yeah. So if we, if we can agree, I don't know if we can even agree on this, that, <laughs> that um, agreement is the th this is an interdependent system. And, and I think we have to define what that means interdependent means it's not independent right and what would that truly mean if things were truly independent then they couldn't really function they couldn't change they couldn't interact with anything there would be basically nothing that we would call life mm. movement so logic would tell you that, <clears throat> that we are in some kind of interdependent uh, dynamic sort of system mm -hmm. So there are different, as Claudia pointed out, and as, as Buddhism points out, different beings experience 
uh, the appearance of things in different ways based on their particular propensities and where they're at as a being. So we're not always, we're not, not everybody's going to even think of a tree falling in the woods as a tree right. falling in the woods the way humans do. Right. It's a completely different thing. And the other, I, the other point I wanted to make is that without, if there were no consciousness whatever in the universe, if there was no awareness whatsoever in the universe, could we actually say anything does exist? Because I think it's through awareness or consciousness that we're able to posit that there is existence. Otherwise, if there is no consciousness anywhere, could there even be existence? That's the, that's the question I always come to. Yeah. So that consciousness in that sense mm -hmm. is fundamental along with, along with this energy, this very subtle energy that can appear in different ways depending on the consciousness that's looking at it. Right. Uh, or, or that, is, you know, the, mm, the consciousness that is observing it, I should say. Right. Which is very, I mean, we're talking really subtle, subtle oh, things so, here. Yeah. So I would say, to answer your question, Brian, how would we actually know that we've had, you know, and, and reached enlightenment? <clears throat> and I think the answer would be, we would have such a sense of um, connection and kind of a, a happiness and a joy and an understanding that, well, things can really, it, it is possible for things to work properly and, and wholesomely in an interdependent fashion. Mm -hmm. I have found this for myself. Wow, don't I want to help everybody else do the same? Right. That's basically what, what my understanding of Buddha is an enlightened being, is they've, they've realized that, they've seen that this doesn't have to involve suffering. It doesn't have to. Right. And if you reach that point, you go, if I could do it, so can every other person. Chris, Chris have you been taught I, as well? I, I've been taught that there is a state, and I can't even, don't even remember if it's the path of seeing, when, when, when there is an experience of perceiving, basically a direct perception of emptiness. Path um, of seeing. Again, it's not <laughs> that, that there is also, they explicitly state that, at that moment, all doubt disappears. Right. Have, does that sound familiar? Like, I, yes, not, yes, yeah. yes, yes, that, yes. That you, there is a point at which there is a, 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 a like all your doubts about all of this stuff will go away. <laughs> um, right, right, yeah. right. I, I don't know. I'm not there. Yeah, I mean, you st you, one still hasn't reached that level of, of omniscience where we, we get rid of the uh, looking at Basically, it's looking at these three spheres of existence, which is a, a consciousness um, observing some what, what would be an object of consciousness and the kind of interaction that takes place between those two. That still has not been recognized as being completely all of that, you know, being completely empty of any kind of inherent existence. They all are relating to one another and depending on one another. Just as we've been talking, the way... It, a table appears to the fly, depends right. on the table, depends on the fly. And it's um, and the way the fly interacts with that table depends on how the table is appearing to the fly. I mean, so it's. I have a little. This is this is something that a Buddha actually understands completely. When you've reached enlightenment, you've 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 yeah. removed all of that. Yeah, this is a little humorous side note for any of you who have ever looked at the images the paintings that they do the Indi the indians and the tibetan buddhists do of these various beings with a number of arms and faces and mm -hmm. eyeballs and i was thinking that maybe what they're trying to convey here is that as you evolve your bandwidth of perception and um ability to act you keep adding on so it's sort of like you add on the the dragonflies visual things you know, dragonfly like visual so they're trying to depict the accumulation of all these different yeah things. depict in a they actually talk about the the five wisdom eyes like the five right like, right, and right, right. right like like tara with eyes on her hands and an eye here and a, yeah so i think they're 
I think that's what they're getting at. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I think they're it's... psychologically symbolic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would be very <laughs> weird to see something it, like that. It actually gives me a new receptivity to looking at some of these outlandish images with 24 arms yeah. and four faces and three eyes on every one of those. So 12 eyes. Right. It's sort of an interesting... It's image. it's a symbol. Yeah. Um. Of anyway, our capacity, I guess. And as Sacred One Unity just said, the more we see clearly, the more we can do to benefit all. Absolutely, this yeah. This has really come up for us. We recently had a real challenge of helping some of the people in our immediate sphere mm -hmm. because we just aren't fucking omniscient and clairvoyant <laughs> and don't know what to do to help. I want to be <laughs> I want to be omniscient. Right. So I know what to do. The problem is, you 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 want to help in the way you think it's the best for them to be helped. Right. The, right. The reality is that we, we we don't know what the reality. We is. don't know. Not yet. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. But, but right. what's happening is probably exactly what should be happening based upon their karma, causes and conditions. Their karma, causes and conditions. So you know. You I know. wouldn't say should. I'd say it is what is happening. Well, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we've all experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be exactly. lovely if I yeah. had um, missions, and then their karma would, and my karma would be different. Well, but yeah. If that's you, where I'm working on. I'm trying to get my karma. If you knew exactly the thing you could say or do that would make a shift, yeah, that would be helpful. You know? Right, right. That would, wouldn't that be wonderful? No, it's no, like I going mean, back to the four men. I have a yeah. uh, big shift that has stuck with me from a Buddhist. Uh, a Tibetan Buddhist uh, nun who, in response to one of my big angst questions, was just fucking do it. <laughs> and I mean, that was many years ago. And whenever I get into this sort of angst, like self doubt, shame, pity, whatever the hell, um, it's just so incredibly helpful. Yeah. I don't know what that has to do with that. I, 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 well, I, I believe in this, but I, 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 I run this. Okay. I run a family support group for families who have people with severe mental health issues. And almost to all of them, including myself, you know, over the years, people will come in and say, well, you know, what can I do? How can I change this? How can I make this person better? How can I, you know, and one of the things that you have to understand is that, you know, you are limited in your capacity to affect change and you're affecting change or you want to affect the change in the way you think it should happen. Right. But that's not necessarily the way the change is going to happen or that you have any special control over making the change happen in the way you want to. Right. And you can try and you can show people the path or multiple paths or multiple options. But, you know, you're not a, you're not, um, what is it? Um, omniscient. Omniscient. Yeah, and yeah. you're not able to control the actions of uh, anyone else, yeah. and so that's all that you can do. Right. Even even uh, mm -hmm. you know, if there is a Buddha, if there is such thing as as uh, Buddhas, and if they are omniscient, well, then you'd have to say, well, they can't change anybody either. Mm -hmm. If they don't have that's omniscience is not a power. Or say you know, there's an omniscient God. Well. Wouldn't they have changed everything already yeah. if they could have, right? That's right. omnipotent. Um, well, that's omnipotent. That's no, God is omniscient and omnipotent. Yeah. Buddha is not omnipotent. But if God is omniscient and omnipotent, well, wouldn't what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> why? Why is there suffering? Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. So there, uh, clearly, this is something each consciousness has to has to transform themselves. That would be my my conclusion, and. And there are there is help, definitely. Like you're helping helping the the group, the family group, or there's help from our spiritual teachers, or there's mm -hmm. help from you know the Buddhist teachings. But it's but we are the ones who have to make the change. Do it. Yeah, have to do we, it. We need to find the Buddha who's alive today and find out what that you know what they think today versus. Well, you know, many people think uh, His Holiness is the emanation yeah, of the no. Buddha Chenrezig, but you know, I mean, we. I'm, yeah, how can you even measure well, that? Or... Like trying to, you know, I mean, we are, and we can't. They say that us regular beings would not be able to see a Buddha. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's say His Holiness is a Buddha. We wouldn't, because of where we're at, we wouldn't be able to see His Buddha. But, we wouldn't have the bandwidth. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've heard these stories, but apparently, 
you know, some enlightened beings see actually when they see look at him, supposedly, they see Shen Rezi. I okay, mean, I can't sit there. We're, we're past it. time. I, okay. I didn't realize this is a great uh, conversation. Uh, um, Superman Unity says, uh, when desire no longer drives us, we are moved by our heart, and that benefits all. It's our freedom to change ourselves. A Buddha can see you, but one cannot see a Buddha until one sees oneself as a Buddha. There you go. <laughs> well, okay, I want to thank you again, Claudia, for, you know, continuing this very, you know, stimulating conversation we've been having. Yeah, we will uh, get back to the um, orthodoxy soon. What orthodoxy? The books. Oh, well, even that, that they raises all kinds of things. What we're going yeah. into next is the five paths and the three yeah. spheres and all this stuff. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, Argentina doesn't let up. Everyone <laughs> unity says, thank y'all, hope to meet you someday. Mm. And likewise, sacred one unity. All right, let's uh, just close with uh, some some uh, dedication prayers. Okay. Let's do the final dedication, bottom of the second page, uh, in English, so we know what we're saying. In all my lives, may I not be separated from true lamas, and so enjoy the splendor of dharma, fully perfecting the virtues of levels and paths. May I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara, which is the primordial Buddha that we all have the capacity to become. And then the final dedication prayer at the bottom of the third page. Oh, no, that was the final dedication prayer. I still, I want to do the one about the, yeah, I want to do the, yeah, I want to do the yeah. Bodhi mind and the emptiness, the dedication prayers at the bottom of two. Yeah. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. May the view of emptiness, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, especially Claudia today. Um, oh, you know what? Claudia, do you have that written down? Yes, and I can send that to... I'm probably going to send it to Brian. Who can send yeah, and then you can send it to me, and I'll put it in the uh, the uh, study guide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Claudia, and everybody else. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Love seeing you, as always. This was great. <laughs> Love to all you Zoomer people. <laughs> I'm shutting us down now. <laughs> um...